afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's a joy to uh, be with you today and to uh, follow through with a topic that I've been assigned to talk about the sovereignty of God. What does this mean? What difference does uh, this uh, truth have in our lives? So we're going to uh, look at the sovereignty of God as a biblical concept, as a cosmic concept, as a social concept, and as a, a personal concept. And uh, there are handouts, uh, three different charts. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, raise your hand or get uh, Christian's attention, and uh, you'll get three uh, different uh, sheets of paper with uh, charts. So what is the sovereignty of God? I, this is weird, but I looked it up in Wikipedia. So, and it had, I thought, an excellent definition. The sovereignty of God is the Christian teaching that God is supreme authority in all things are under his control. It's the Christian teaching that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. Now, it's curious that in the remainder of the article, fairly substantial article, they um, raise a lot of problems, a lot of issues uh, with their own definition. But nevertheless, uh, they had a great start. The first sentence was, uh, was good. The, you know, God is God. We are not. We have the privilege, the awesome unspeakably wonderful privilege of being God's children, God's images, God's likeness, God's stewards on earth, uh, but only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the sovereign, is the one who uh, holds and manages all the authority. And there's some Bible passages that help to uh, capture this idea. Uh, so we're going to look at Genesis uh, 1. Uh, the first three verses, the way the Bible starts. So we're going to scroll up a little bit here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth didn't have any shape. It was empty. There was darkness over the face of the waters. At that time, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, Three remarkable reminders of God's sovereignty. In a way, all of uh, uh, the Trinity represented too. But in the beginning, God created. So that the, uh, before the beginning, there was God. Before the Big Bang, there was God. You know, we don't study what happened before the Big Bang in uh, the natural sciences because it's impossible. But uh, the question still uh, lingers. Who lit the fuse for the Big Bang, right? And uh, the Bible goes then before that to uh, in the beginning was God. And that the spirit hovered over the waters, and then all God had to say was, let there be light, and there was light. So toward the end of that same chapter, uh, other ways of emphasizing God's sovereignty, God says, uh, let us make human beings so that they are like us. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Let them rule over the livestock and over the wild animals and let them rule over the creatures that move along the ground. So God is giving a kind of sovereignty, assigning it to his image, to his likeness, but of course it's God's sovereignty to give. So the basic idea of God is sovereign. Is, uh, is still the underlying truth. So God created human beings in his own likeness. He created them to be like himself. He created them to be uh, male and female. God blessed them and said, have children so that there will be many of you. Fill the earth and bring it under your control. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Rule over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I'm giving you every plant. So it's God to give. It's God's to give. Again, he's the sovereign and shares the goodness of uh, this wonderful planet Earth uh, with us. And then to jump ahead to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. Evening and morning, uh, it was uh, day six. 
So right from the beginning, many different uh, descriptive reminders of God's uh, sovereignty. A couple of other passages we'll look at here, and then we'll see more again. But at the end of Romans uh, 11, just before we're uh, asked to be the walking demonstrations of God's will, uh, there is this beautiful poetic summary, a kind of a hymn to uh, God's greatness and God's authority. How very rich are God's wisdom and knowledge. He judges, he, uh, how he judges is more than how we can understand. The way he deals with people is more than we can know. Who can ever know what the Lord is thinking? Or who can ever give him advice? Has anyone ever given anything to God so that God has to pay them back? All things come from him. All things are directed by him. All things are for his praise. May God be given the glory forever. In the older translations, it's from him, through him, for him are all things. A great description of God's sovereignty. And then, uh, we're going to uh, see then in the very next verse, which begins uh, Romans 12, I beseech you, uh, brothers and sisters, offer yourselves, offer your bodies living sacrifice to, to God because of his amazing uh, gift to us in order to prove that God's will is good. Uh, roll it back uh, uh, a little bit to prove in our lives by giving uh, freely. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I didn't uh, put it on there. Forgive me. So then Romans 12 begins with, uh, offer yourselves living sacrifices to God. Not, don't have to burn yourself to death or, or kill yourself, but be a living witness, a living voice, uh, a daily gift to God, uh, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed that you will show, you know, by your life, that God's will is good, that it's acceptable, that it's perfect. And I think sometimes we miss the point. It's like, maybe on a really good day, it seems like that day we've demonstrated by our lives that God's sovereign will is good. We've allowed people to see that God's will could get a beat. It's good. Uh, but on a better day, uh, where maybe we focus more on, on God's grace, maybe we grew more, we saw other people and their potential and talk hope and, and opportunity uh, into their lives, then we can say that day we, we show that God's will is acceptable, you know, more than just good, it's a, it's a B plus. But I long for the days, and hopefully uh, uh, many days going forward, maybe uh, work on getting every day this week, a day where what we do, how we live as God's representatives, as representatives of God's will, we show that his will is perfect. That it's good, acceptable, and perfect. All right. So, and then uh, Revelation ends also on a very... Strong note of God's sovereignty. Uh, John saying, I'm writing everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Suppose someone uh, adds anything to it, then uh, God wants that person to play. Suppose someone takes anything from this book of prophecy that God gave through me, then God will take away from that person the blessings told about this book. Uh, so very strong statement of God's sovereignty and God's authority through the scriptures and letting the scriptures be the scriptures. God is God. We are God's children. We are God's image. We are God's likeness. But we're not God. <laughs> and sometimes people slip from one to the other. I've been in a lot of meetings with power-hungry church leaders. Uh, just, just for clarity, none of them that I'm going to describe really at all to my wonderful experience with Emmanuel. So don't try to guess who you might know. But power hungry church leaders on a national basis, and they'll be talking about, we have to follow the Lord on this, we have to follow the Lord. And then they say, therefore do it my way. 
and they slip into do it my way as if they were God. And uh, that's where I, I said, wait a minute. We even even discussed your plan, and there's some problems I see with it. And then it's all uh, like uh, I'm, you know, not honoring their authority. I think uh, it's it's a matter very often of uh, our allowing sometimes uh, church leaders and, and leaders in every other field, in politics and economics and other areas too, to. Uh, uh, have inflated ideas of their own sovereignty and authority rather than acknowledge the ultimate sovereignty of God. So there are two big issues. These come up uh, even in the Wikipedia uh, article on uh, sovereignty of God, uh, but I think they don't answer them very well. So I'm just going to give you my uh, brief answer. One issue is uh, if all things are under God's control, why does God let so much bad happen? Well, that's an issue that's deserving of a whole seminar in its own right. Uh, but one of the answers to that uh, is that God allows bad things to happen to help us to build patience and toughness and courage um, and compassion to those that are suffering around us or we can uh, step in or maybe they're not even there. They're the other side of the world where we can show compassion. There are many opportunities of, of, of becoming more and more a godly woman or a godly man in the trials and tribulations of temporal life. So uh, apart from those, if God gave you, uh, you know, just a, a rose garden with no thorns, uh, I think a lot of us would be weaklings uh, pretty quick and, and just uh, not. Uh, becoming the strong decision makers, wise leaders that God desires us to be. Another reason why God allows uh, um, evil things to happen, bad things to happen, is that uh, a lot of times bad things happen because of bad choices, the free will that he gave to humanity. Um, and a lot of people choke over that. And I understand if you say God is sovereign, Everything is in his hands. Uh, all things are under his control. If you go with that uh, definition, then how do you have free will? How do I have free will? Well, God's sovereignty is so profound, so beyond our concept of sovereignty, that he's able to create beings with free will, although He's got limits on all of us. We don't have total, complete free will. Uh, he will uh, have a variety of ways to stop us when we are crossing lines. But at the same time, uh, we do exercise huge amounts of free will, even the free will to rebel against God, free will to work against God's purposes. And, and so uh, this is an amazing uh, gift of liberty, of uh, free will that God uh, put in the hands uh, right from the beginning of the first humans. And as you know, they use this uh, free will to uh, uh, damage their relationship with God. So uh, think of this in terms of uh, two problems. Uh, one is God has his reasons, therefore, uh, to allow for uh, bad stuff both in part to uh, help us to uh, be, give us opportunity for service and, and compassion, et cetera, and also literally uh, pouring into us free will so that a lot of the bad that happens uh, is uh, because uh, not only do you have free will, uh, but uh, someone on the, on the street has free will who might have an attitude of doing you harm. Uh, and you could ask, I've had discussions with people repeatedly, dozens of times, uh, discussions just raising the question, would you rather be a puppet, never make a free choice, just programmed completely uh, to do always the right thing, or would you rather have free will and all other humans around you have free will and they have the right then to, to love you, which they couldn't do as a puppet, that would just be behavior 
of love, not the real love, right? And they could hurt you too because they've got free will. Of course, you can do things to preemptively protect yourself. You know, which would you rather be, a puppet with all these protections or a person of free will? And I've never met someone who said they'd rather be a dumb puppet. So uh, please don't break my record. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think people understand that being a human being is uh, such an incredible um, gift, such an incredible uh, uh, place of, uh, of honor in God's creation. And, and this, of course, the whole idea of free will being suppressed in so many countries, where uh, I'm a part of a project to try to awaken the media to the seven countries that are the worst in persecuting their own citizens. Uh, the seven countries are China, North Korea, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Iran, Syria. I think I got all seven in, but anyway. And these are countries we're having all kinds of other issues with too. Why can't we make uh, the issue of protection of uh, people's right to uh, worship um, a, uh, a part of our continuing negotiation uh, in all these. And to raise that as a question uh, for CNN to ask the candidates uh, in about 10 days. Wouldn't that be good? What would you do if you were uh, president and talking with these people? So I do think that the whole idea of human freedom is, is not something that's equal. We have such freedoms in this country. We can appreciate how God has made us and a lot of places, uh, uh, freedom just doesn't exist as, uh, as we are so accustomed to, as you know. You know, I was an uh, underground missionary in Eastern Europe twice as a, a much younger person during the time of the Iron Curtain. And I, I lived with, worked with, ministered with uh, people who, who literally danced with death for their uh, service of Jesus Christ. And that was uh, then coming back and dealing with mediocre churchianity. Uh, I've never been able to get accustomed to mediocre churchianity because I've lived with people for whom their faith was life and death. Uh, so at any rate, the freedom that God gives us, I think paradoxically, I think we can hold paradoxically, God can figure it out a lot better than our finite minds, but paradoxically, do not rob God of his sovereignty. They are a higher sovereignty. They give testimony to a higher sovereignty that God has the power to create free will while he continues to run the universes uh, with uh, complete sovereignty at the same time. I think it's a paradox, but I think it's a true um, both parts are, are true. So uh, the sovereignty of God is the biblical uh, teaching. It's also uh, what, I, uh, what I think is, has to be seen as a cosmic uh, teaching. And um, so we have up here an outline of uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 13 through 20. Um, I don't know if anyone here has uh, studied a chiasm. Um, but I've, I, I have two charts representing uh, these verses. If you'd scroll up uh, a little bit further, Colossians 1, and we've got... So a basic outline, if you look carefully at the text, verses 13 and 20 say something very similar. And then closer in, verses uh, 14 and the first part of 20, say something similar. Then verses 15 and 19 say something similar. And then verses 16 and 18 say something similar. And the very middle of all of it is 17. So it's kind of like a mountain where you're climbing up and, and you get the, this core truth of verse 17 that, uh, that all things were made uh, by him and for him uh, and uh, he is what holds the universe together. That's verse uh, 17. So in this hymn in Colossians chapter 1, 
Uh, Paul is giving great praise to Christ as the sovereign. So let's scroll down to the, my second chart of these same verses. This kind of gives a little bit of the image of, we'll stop right there. So he rescued us from dominion of darkness is the theme of verse 13. Verse 20b, he makes peace through his blood, sacrifice on the cross. Similar points, right? So we can imagine uh, putting this kind of on its side. In fact, let's scroll, just momentarily scroll to the next uh, graphic. So we can imagine uh, doing E, D, C, B, A, and then back down. But what's so crucial is that all this is supported by E and D, for example, on both sides. But the framing of it this way, uh, as this chiasm, it's a powerful linguistic tool that Paul is using, Framing it this way, even if you haven't identified it, in your soul, you just feel it going higher and higher until you get to verse 17, and then you're, you're sliding slowly back down the same hill. Uh, so he exists above and before all things, and in him all things hold together. Wow. Talk about total sovereignty. He's, he's not only the, the one that created it, he's the one that's for that's the whole universe is for the Lord. But he's also the cosmic glue. He's the one that holds it all together. Uh, just a, a quick reference. My, um, in uh, uh, collegiate studies, my major was math. My minor was physics. And I was always intrigued by this search for a unified field theory. Because the the basic contents of, of fields, um, different subatomic fields, for example, uh, strong and weak uh, uh, fields, and gravitational field, and electromagnetic fields, these are all very different, have uh, different characteristics. But the goal would be to have one uh, equation that would pull all this together, give a, a vivid sense of how all the physics of the universe hangs together with one field, even though all we can do is, uh, uh, at the present time, is, is label and give some amazing description of, I forget now how many, but at least five or six different fields. And, um, and I think it's a great effort. Maybe someday uh, that, that goal will be achieved. But, but I think that what the Bible teaches is a unified person theory. What holds the universe together is not uh, physical fields, but something deeper. The very person of Jesus Christ, the very person of God, is what holds all the universes together. He is the cosmic glue, as this verse says, right? He's what holds it all together. So what holds you together? Hopefully it's Jesus too, right? Individually, this applies individually. What holds our, our church together? Well, lots of, we're all doing lots of things for, for the good, but it's Jesus that is and his grace that holds that together. And, and I think that uh, the, all the gravitational fields and the um, electromagnetic fields, et cetera, all these things are, are still held together. He, it's not that the Lord was the creator and then went on a vacation. The Lord is the creator, sustains his creation has a personal engagement in the creation. And therefore, uh, how we treat the world matters to him because he's not just off uh, you know, uh, light years away. He is intensely involved in maintaining and holding together his creation. And that's part of his being sovereign. Doesn't that, doesn't that come across well for you? The sovereignty of God, this power, this incredible unique role of God uh, is cosmic. So um, now we're going to go on. Uh, I'm going to go through these other points of it being a social truth, being a personal truth, um, and uh, talk about some of the uh, implications. Um, if you have a question that you're just super eager to, to ask, feel free to blurt it out. Otherwise, uh, we'll. Uh, continue to open up these ideas until 
about uh, 4.30, and then we'll have a strictly question and answer. All right, so God's sovereignty as a social uh, fact. So one of the uh, uh, charts that we um, distributed uh, has uh, uh, the idea of uh, God as sovereign of uh, different spheres of life. And I'm just realizing I gave to Christian all my copies. If I could have that chart, I'll be uh, grateful. Thank you. So this chart uh, looks like this. Um, the sovereignty of God within every sphere of our lives. Um, it's one thing to say, you know, God is sovereign, God is in charge, uh, all is good, I'm, I'm committed, and, and we feel that way maybe especially on Sundays or other times, today is Saturday, other times we're in church. Uh, but the idea of seeing if God is truly sovereign of all the world, then he's sovereign for me personally, but he's also sovereign for my family life, uh, just to go uh, down the left column here on this chart, he's sovereign for uh, education. Uh, he's sovereign in the sciences. God is sovereign on the back page there uh, for government, for media and communications, for arts and entertainment, uh, business and professional world, and um, organized religion. Now, each of those could have been broken down, too. Uh, so this is a super simplified chart, all right? Where this is not the most fine-grained uh, chart, but uh, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. Let's, let's look at some of these core questions. The insights as to how the sovereignty of God needs to be applied in every area in life was especially pushed, um, I would say, 150 years ago, uh, by a man by the name of Abraham Kuyper, who was um, a political leader in the Netherlands, my uh, uh, family's uh, home country. And uh, he was uh, president of the Free University of Amsterdam, which at the time was a Christian university. And he was the head of the Christian political party. And um, uh, toward the end of the 1800s, he became prime minister for a few years. So he was an active politician, education leader, theologian, and minister. So in his own way, working in uh, several fields and uh, being a leader in several fields. Now, what he argued that, there's, that God's sovereignty applies in every sphere of life, however finely we define those spheres, is very important for uh, lots of reasons. Let me suggest a couple of his arguments. He said, you know, too often when business people want to talk about uh, how, their, how the Bible affects their, uh, their business or their priorities, a um, uh, minister feels as though uh, he's got to show up and tell them what to do. So that it's the church's authority rather than the business expertise of uh, people that themselves can study the Bible, themselves can uh, explore uh, uh, God's uh, truth in the um, teachings of the Bible. Uh, but it is his opinion, it was his opinion, uh, even though he participated in several different spheres of life, that uh, people should be empowered to pray together, to work together, people that had shared professional or, or uh, uh, work uh, relationships, professional fields uh, or expertise, um, uh, areas of business or whatever, to meet together, uh, to uh, uh, talk, to share, to encourage each other, um, with or without a priest or minister. Because they themselves ought to be able to read the Bible and come up with insights uh, for um, uh, serving the Lord. I'm, I'm trying to think of the first name of a man that I met years ago uh, in Chicago. He was um, the general counsel of General Motors. He was the top attorney for General Motors. He had hundreds of attorneys working for him. And he was 
a vice president of General Motors. And he was uh, a uh, outspoken Christian man. His uh, last name is Johnson, and if I think of his first name, I'll uh, mention it uh, in a moment. But uh, he, he became, when he realized being assigned to be vice president, one of the vice presidents of General Motors, and the general counsel having to handle all the, the different suits and legal disputes, when he was given this, it just awakened him to say, wait a minute, I believe in God, I want to be a godly man, but I've never really asked the question, how does my faith relate to being a corporate leader? So he asked his pastor, if the pastor wouldn't mind, if once a week he and other business people could meet together and just talk, ask questions, answer questions, uh, explore the challenges that they had in uh, business, um, and to pray for one another. And the pastor said, uh, no. The pastor said, no. I couldn't believe it. The pastor said, no, because I don't know anything about your world, so I can't lead this. And Mr. Johnson said, no, 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 no. You can be there, and we'd love to have you there, but, but we know our world, and many of us have studied the Bible, and, and we'd love to have your input, but we're not looking for you to give us all the answers. We just want to, as business people, explore this sphere of business. And he never was able to persuade his pastor to allow them to meet at the church. Isn't that amazing? Uh, instead, when he finally realized it was a hopeless case, and this is a, a large church, a prosperous church. It wasn't for, it, we're not talking about a storefront church or whatever. This was, they had plenty of space. They had plenty of resources. They could have bought the coffee and donuts for this group. No problem in their budget. But they choked over it. The pastor choked over it because it was outside his expertise. And he somehow thought that as a church leader, he had to run the Christian lives of everybody in politics or business or the arts or communications, which is impossible. How could the pastor know all that? Uh, but at any rate, a Christian college near where he lived agreed to give him a room to meet with his uh, other colleagues in business, and um, so their group thrived. So there's a, a beautiful end to the story. Among other things, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson uh, was the first person to ever bring together the uh, leaders of the corporate auto industry with the leaders of the uh, auto insurance industry. They had never had uh, official communication between the people that provide you insurance for your driving uh, and the people that design and build your car. Which, you know, you think, why wouldn't they talk? Because both of them are interested in blessing you with a safe, healthy drive. Uh, because if you're, if you're not hurt, you're going to keep buying their cars and keep buying their insurance. And they don't have to pay out the insurance if you're uh, not so hurt, if the car is more safe. And so a number of safety features came out of this uh, uh, dialogue where uh, they had never listened to each other before. But here is a Christian man believing in communication, both communication with God, but people listening to and communicating with one another. And these two groups that had siloed themselves, had segregated themselves, he said, we must meet. And he hosted those meetings. And a lot of good came uh, out of that for all of us, uh, including the enforcement of seatbelt rules and what was called friendly environment, you know, padded dashboards, better shaped dashboards without sharp edges, you know, things that maybe uh, you seem, you would think it would be obvious. But they came out of these discussions between Mr. Johnson and uh, insurance executives. But, but the point again is people in different fields are the experts in those fields uh, 
they can receive insight from people from other fields, including pastors, but growing in their own godliness uh, without seeing it as a church thing, without seeing it as something that uh, has to be run by the pastor is a huge step forward that um, Abraham Kuyper pushed hard on. Um, and and uh, so uh, let's look at some of the questions at the top of this chart. Uh, where can we serve God? If he's the sovereign, where can we serve him? And there are a lot of different places. Every place in the world we can serve God, and, um, and especially as we divide up even being in one place, there are dozens of different ways we can serve God with the expertise that each of us has. So the sovereignty of God, by being uh, explained in different fields of our lives, helps to uh, make it much more vital. Uh, how is God sovereign in your field, in your work? Uh, and that uh, counts as both as uh, husbands and wives and uh, uh, mothers and fathers or uh, sons and daughters in our family life, uh, but, uh, but certainly in uh, professional areas too. So where is God's authority? Where is his sovereignty? Um, and too often we've thought of it as a church doctrine only rather than um, as, a, as a way that, that we can shape our professional lives and our uh, personal relationships as well. Is God sovereign enough to create free will that could oppose God? Well, we touched on that earlier. I think so. I think it's a higher sovereignty. The, there are a lot of people that argue, and uh, some of them uh, call themselves Calvinists. So a lot of people argue that because God is sovereign, then it's all fatalism. Uh, who gets saved and not saved is, is no longer a matter of evangelism or missionary work. It's all just all predetermined because God is sovereign. But that's a narrow, that's a dead sense of sovereignty, not the vibrant sovereignty by which God creates free will in every human heart. So what are some of the guidelines of godly living in each sphere of life? Well, it, we'll get to that in the chart in a moment. How is God's ethos taught and lived? So let's take a look at the uh, chart. There are a lot of different Bible verses that we uh, quote here. Uh, we don't need to uh, uh, recite each one. Uh, but you know, trust in the Lord in Proverbs in your personal life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your personal understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Let him direct your paths, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. How many have uh, memorized that, studied that? It's a great, great couple of verses. It was uh, hanging on a plaque just to the right of the front door in the home where I was raised. So I saw that plaque every time I stepped out of the house. Um, and I'm glad I did. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out what to hang just to the right of the exit door of your home, that'd be uh, a verse to put. In Romans 12, we uh, just looked at family life, the biblical standards of family life. Exodus 20, verse 12, honor father and mother. Now it's curious, it doesn't say obey father and mother. The words about obeying father and mother uh, in the Bible, the word is always children, obey your uh, parents, and the word there is for someone who's 12 or younger. Um, those of us uh, teenage and, and past still uh, can honor father and mother to give uh, uh, glory to God in our uh, family relationships. Um, in Ephesians uh, 5, uh, uh, 21 is a verse that's often skipped over where the very theme verse of family relations uh, for Paul is the statement to submit to one another for the sake of Christ. That all of us in each family submit to one another for the sake of Christ. Find ways to serve each other 
find ways to put the others first. In education, uh, the uh, passage in Deuteronomy 6 is so powerful and utilized so well in our Jewish community. If you uh, see a mezuzah on uh, the door of someone's office or uh, on the door of their apartment or, uh, or other places where they uh, frequent, uh, those mezuzahs, those little packets, have these verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and a few more verses. Um, and these are verses that say, uh, here, O Israel, pay attention. Uh, we're, we're often now heard of being told we have to be awakened. We have to awake to new realities. Well, we have to awake to God's presence, too. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, and then it goes on to say, to put these words on your doorposts. Put these words uh, on uh, jewelry. Be reminded of uh, these statements. In your home, uh, repeat them uh, to your children in the morning. Repeat them to your children in the evening. So that having the scriptures, especially the core teachings of love to God and the uniqueness of God, those awesome teachings, very important for um, uh, raising up uh, children in the home and uh, raising up children in school. In uh, Luke chapter 2, those verses describe Jesus' education, which uh, uh, just stunning reminders of the multidimensional uh, growth that Jesus had as a child. And then uh, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, verse that I love to emphasize, uh, Paul says to one of his students, the things that I've taught you teach others who will teach others. Now that's so powerful in just a very simple verse. Four generations of learners are pointed out. Paul says, what I, a learner, taught you, Timothy, be sure to teach others who will teach others. And of course, that's why we're here. Because those others taught others, who taught others, who taught others, and uh, great wisdom of the scripture, great wisdom of Christian living has uh, been transferred generation to generation. And the, the sciences, we looked at Colossians, that Colossians uh, passage. Uh, to me, the more you realize how Jesus is the cosmic glue, how the amazing universe is uh, his workmanship, uh, should excite our interest to study science all the more, even though in a particular science class, God may not be mentioned, but we're still studying his work. And I think that's an important acceptance to make. We can study with non-believers, but we know the creator and can give uh, the creator uh, special credit. And that passage in Psalm 111 uh, emphasizes the importance of, tr of learning and understanding the world around us and uh, taking the time to study. Now, science as we know it uh, developed long after uh, the Bible was completed, um, but the roots of that curiosity, the roots of using more and more knowledge about the world to uh, be of service to other people, um, so God's sovereignty within the expansion of knowledge uh, is a lesson of the Bible and uh, was taken to heart by uh, early uh, scientists, many of whom were uh, Christian people. On the back side, government. You know, one of my favorite verses on government is this uh, verse that's on the Liberty Bell, uh, Leviticus uh, 25.10. So powerful in just a few words. And the whole verse was actually cast into the Liberty Bell. It's part of the actual mold that created the Liberty Bell 20 years before, more than 20 years before the Declaration of Independence. So liberty was in the air in America long before uh, the, uh, our early uh, American uh, mothers and fathers decided to uh, separate from the British Empire. And uh, 
That verse says, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. Now notice it doesn't say proclaim liberty throughout the land to all your Jewish brothers and sisters. It's to all the inhabitants. So there's a compassion for whatever the right word is, depending on your translation. In uh, Leviticus 25, they're called aliens or non-citizens or whatever. Uh, but nevertheless, <coughs> the benefits of liberty being poured to every human being, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. Isn't that a gracious move? To put that Bible verse on the Liberty Bell is a great reminder of how the, the Bible is a source for guidance in uh, uh, social relationships. And then uh, Proverbs uh, about authority of uh, our leaders, uh, Acts, uh, uh, Scamaliel argues for uh, the government uh, leaders backing off from persecuting the disciples. Uh, just you know, let them be. Uh, just it is possible that, that God is actually working through them, Gamaliel says, and uh, we dare not be uh, working contrary to God. So he says, don't fight them. Don't stop them. And they listened to him, though they still beat up the apostles before they released them. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the way it should have been, but at least they didn't kill the uh, disciples, the apostles of Jesus at that time. And in 1 Timothy 2, we're reminded to pray for our leaders that there uh, would be peace. In media and communications, uh, you know, the, the way that God communicates to us is stated so powerfully in Psalm uh, 19, um, the communication of the gospel, the broad uh, international communication of the gospel uh, cast as an opportunity in, in the first few verses of Acts. And um, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 as well, just a, a great model of uh, communication. Now, modern media, totally different uh, from... Uh, what they had in the biblical times, but yet uh, the idea that the media is a, a part of God's sovereignty, as is government, as is education, science, family, personal life, and then arts and entertainment uh, as well. This is a great passage in Exodus 31 about people that were filled with the Spirit in order to create the Ark of the Covenant. The artwork that made the Ark of the Covenant possible was uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit uh, working through, and I don't even, I rarely say these names, so I have to hesitate to read them here in that second column. Bazalel and Aholahab, Aholiab. Aholiab? Look right? Anyway, I've never met Aholiab or uh, uh, Bazal, Bazal. But at any rate, isn't that a great passage where the, the Spirit guides the artwork of these? And the, um, the music of the Psalms, such a great reminder of how powerful the arts are in giving uh, praise to God. And then Ephesians 5, too, talking about using hymns and, and spiritual songs uh, together to encourage one another and to uh, uh, give praise to God. And finally, uh, business and professional life. The whole mission God gave our ancestors to, to take charge of the resources of earth, to be responsible as his representatives on earth uh, with all the resources. This is uh, business and professional life of uh, the earliest uh, times. And, um, and, and similarly, in, in Deuteronomy uh, 8, 18, let's take a look uh, exactly what's said there. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. The text says, um, Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so can 
confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So it's God that gives, gives us this ability to create wealth. We should uh, recognize that uh, gift, use it well, and give God glory. And um, uh, then in uh, Luke uh, 14, a uh, reminder of uh, being good stewards as well. And then organized religion. Uh, day of rest devoted to honoring God. Uh, the uh, time of uh, worshiping together in people's homes in the early uh, church and in Acts uh, 16. Uh, meeting in the home of uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, mentioned also in uh, <coughs> Romans uh, uh, 16, verses 3 through 5. You know, Priscilla and Aquila ran a tent-making uh, business, and apparently uh, this was very transportable. So they met Paul in Corinth. Uh, they went to uh, uh, Ephesus with him to help establish a church there, and they brought their business with them. It's a transportable business, and yet they could hire lots of people making tents, and so they could rent or, or, or buy uh, a large facility uh, that could be used then for church meetings uh, in the evenings and mornings, perhaps, and, and Sundays. And then uh, also the uh, 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 later on, they went back to Rome, where they had been, to give strength to the church at Rome, where Paul writes to them in Romans 16 as well. 1 Corinthians 3, the power of uh, being in a place where we could take the masks off and to be uh, uh, people of uh, honesty and to seek God's healing and help together and uh, not to neglect meeting regularly together as Hebrews 10 says. So each of these, these are just a uh, tiny sampling, sampling of biblical verses that teach us how each of these, uh, let's see, five, nine uh, parts of uh, life, spheres of life are. And each of these spheres may overlap other spheres. It's kind of like a Venn diagram. Uh, so there's a multiple uh, applications. So in each of these spheres, there are model people in the Bible. I think of Ruth as an extraordinary human being, and Joseph in Genesis, Mary, Jesus' mother, uh, Paul's life, so incredible. Uh, Paul himself saying that uh, the people should follow his example as he's trying to exemplify Christ. And he says that six places. And I think a lot of people choke over that. Who's Paul to say, hey, follow what my example is? Uh, but I think uh, we choke over it more because we're not so good at being good examples. If we were better examples, we would be um, more inspiring to other people to follow patterns that, that we exemplify. So I, I take it as a challenge myself, I pray you do too, to be a living example of Jesus. And so we have these fine biblical examples. The, in, in terms of family life, Mary and uh, Joseph. But the Shulamite and her groom, the, the shepherd boy, is that Solomon? It's the shepherd that... Uh, the Shulamite's trying to get away. He's, she's trying to get away from Solomon to be able to renew her relationship with the shepherd. Um, you can look at uh, Song of Songs info on the web for a good explanation, an excellent <coughs> literal translation. But uh, also, the prodigal's father. What a model of parenting! So we have a lot of living examples. Joshua the lunar. Uh, Barnabas and Paul as teachers uh, in the scriptures. Uh, not so many good kings in the ancient times, but government uh, uh, led by King David, King Jehoshaphat, Nicodemus, Gamaliel were good models. Um, so much said about communication, so many models in the uh, arts. Certainly uh, many examples in the scripture including the great poetry of scripture, uh, business models, the businesswoman in uh, Proverbs 31, a, a great example of uh, successful, devoted uh, 
woman professional in Proverbs uh, 31 in the ancient times uh, 3,000 years ago. And then uh, they uh, organized religion, the tabernacle, singing of songs, upper room, many places that are the spheres for each of those. So you see we have biblical principles, we have uh, exemplars, but I think one of the most important things to remember is God's ethos, God's ethics, God's core values that uh, penetrate throughout the scriptures. There are themes of these values. I've, uh, years ago, I was challenged by a group of uh, Christian scholars because uh, my specialization in philosophy is ethics. So I said, well, they said to me, what is the primary biblical principle in ethics? And I thought, gee, there are lots of principles. Primary? I don't know. So I was told by one group that the primary principle was justice. And love and accountability, they're relevant, but they kind of serve justice. So justice and fairness, that's what really matters. So the very week that, that, that I had that meeting, a group of uh, other scholars uh, took me out to lunch. And they said, what is your uh, basic principle, biblical principle for uh, uh, ethics? And I said, gee, I don't know. Uh, and they said, well, we think it's love. Because God is love. Because the first commandment for Jesus is to love God above all. Uh, second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So we, uh, we think you ought to agree with us that, it's, that love, that's the primary uh, principle throughout scripture. Well, I was just stunned by this need to have one principle. Uh, but I took it seriously. So I started uh, thinking about it as I was reading the scripture. And uh, one day I, I came across this great phrase, this is the whole law and the prophets, where Jesus says that about the golden rule, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. A proactive golden rule, not just don't do to others, but do for others what you'd want them to do for you. So um, Jesus calls that the whole law and the prophets. I said, wow. How many things does he call that? So I did a search. And there are two other things that Jesus calls the whole law of the prophets. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. That, he says, is the whole law of the prophets. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole law of the prophets. And by the way, Paul, in Romans 13, in uh, Galatians, um, and Peter, in uh, First Peter, uh, each of them call, love your neighbor as yourself, the whole law and the prophets. So those three, do unto others, as the, you'd have them do unto you, the basic principle of justice and fairness, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, basic principle of compassion and love, and uh, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your ultimate uh, submission and accountability to God. Each of these is called the whole law and the prophets. So I thought, wow, I got three. Not just one, I got all three. Right? And then uh, it did hit me that Jesus' great commission that emphasizes paying attention. I don't know if you've noticed that. But Jesus says, teaching them to be vigilant about all that I've commanded. Jesus uses a very strong word here, not just to obey, but to observingly obey, to be vigilant in obeying. And then he says, and look, I'm with you every day till the end of the age. So again, pay attention, look. Look for evidence of my presence. Look, I'm with you every day. So paying attention, that's a good, uh, a uh, basic biblical principle too. Because literally hundreds of times the Bible says the word behold or look or lo, depending on the translation, or hear, like that passage from Deuteronomy 6, hear, hear. Uh, it's 900 times the Bible has the command hear. 1,200 times it has the command look. 
open your eyes. Modern translations think that's too much. So they edit out most of them. So we only have about 300 references to, to look in the modern translations or to hear. For example, instead of saying at the end of Matthew, look, I'm with you always. So look for my evidence, my presence. Um, NIV says, surely I'm with you always. Well, that's lovely. I love surely, right? Surely I'm with you always. I'm, but it's not just to trust him. We ought to be able to recognize evidence of his presence, to be alert to his leadership. So look, I'm with you always. So I came up with this idea, back to the chart, at the top of the chart, uh, where we have the different categories. Uh, let's scroll back on the uh, uh, projection here. Let's scroll back to the top of the chart. And you can all see on uh, the handout as well uh, that we not only have the biblical exemplars, but uh, justice and fairness, as in the golden rule. We have uh, the role of uh, love and compassion, as in love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, stewardship and accountability, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then paying attention, uh, which is expressed very powerfully in the Great Commission. Then what I realized is, uh, as I'm reading here and there in the scripture, Micah 6, 8 has all four principles. Micah 6, 8. That's why I put it at the top of four of these columns. It starts out saying, what does the Lord require of you? It's like, pay attention. What does he require of you? Think about it. Do justice. So what does he require of you? Pay attention. Do justice. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Be accountable. So I, I got fired up. I thought, wow. I got four principles that God puts together in one verse in Micah 6, 8. And three of which Jesus calls the whole law and the prophets. Now, by the way, no one else has a right to call these the whole law and the prophets but Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. Five words represent all the Old Testament. Only Jesus has the right to say that, right? But I accept his authority. It is true, and you can make, the, you can make an argument for his claim. So at any rate, so then it, it, we have then these core values that apply to our lives. When I reported back to those two other groups, neither was happy because even though I agreed with their principle, I recognized three others. So you, you can't necessarily win friends by uh, finding the truth. But I took it as a mission to look for ways that uh, writers have used these core principles to explain um, business or economics or uh, other fields in life. And um, I'll not get into it here, but, but it is uh, something that I could uh, send some of my research papers to all that are interested. Um, how that uh, the founder of the free market system, Adam Smith, argues that it's a free market only if there is compassion, only if there's accountability, and only if there are standards of justice so that the, uh, there's a safety net for people that are, are, uh, are hurt by the system. There has to be a safety net, and there has to be basic principles of justice that are enforced that make the market free. So first it has to be fair, and then we can make it free. And Adam Smith is writing from a biblical point of view. His argument for the fairness, ultimately, one of the strongest arguments he says we have for fairness is that um, in a free market, the poorest are better off than, than even a, a chieftain 
in a, a primitive uh, uh, society so that the free market creates a wealth and, and all boats rise. Even the poorest person is much better off. Adam Smith was saying 100, uh, 240 years ago. Now that needs constant adjustment, but uh, a lot of the ideas of Adam Smith got built into our Small Business Administration, into our uh, Federal Housing Authority, and other ways that uh, make it so anyone uh, willing to work hard uh, uh, and, and receive guidance and wisdom from uh, bureaucratic authority it can get loans, can establish business, uh, and with special uh, opportunities for people who are in minority groups and for women. And uh, thank God, these are models of what make a free market thrive. Um, and again, it's God's sovereignty working through moral principles. As Smith is saying, this is the invisible hand that makes it possible. And Adam Smith is clear when he talks about the invisible hand that allows that in, in a society where the butcher wants to make a living, so he's not going to sell rancid meat. If a butcher sold you rancid meat, if you went down to a particular supermarket uh, and bought meat and it made you sick, how many of us would go back to the same market even once? Or if the guy says, oh, I'm so sorry, that's just a bad shipment. I'll never do it again. We might trust them one more time, right? But having, having food poisoning, I assure you, is no fun. Probably all of us have had that and don't ever want to have it again. So, so the butcher has a motivation to have healthy meat on the counter because uh, not only because he wants you to come back, he wants you to be happy and even recommend uh, his business or her business to uh, your uh, friends. So that the uh, free market enhances the quality and reinforces uh, uh, quality for uh, products, whether it's meat or computers or, or any other thing, uh, because uh, we're motivated to make a better profit. And if there's accountability, then we're not going to be cheating uh, and, and making that profit uh, uh, on the sly rather than based on the quality of product and services. So this is what has made uh, the American economy vibrant, is this awareness through the ideas of Adam Smith, through the ideas uh, in part of uh, uh, the reformers uh, that said that the church should not run the economy, the church uh, and state should not run the economy, so that you have this incredible sense of freedom, probably especially expressed in America. America founded in 1776, the same year that Adam Smith came out with his uh, full theory. And what he wrote uh, was eaten up by uh, American uh, leaders. Just a flashback, in a, in a crazy situation in 1990, I was doing research in Russia. And because I've uh, written articles about social ethics and business ethics and economic ethics, the uh, Russians were eager for me to speak. I was invited to give talks at London Library at the uh, uh, Academy for the Social Sciences, at uh, the Academy of the Sciences, uh, lectures at even Communist Party schools. And given uh, great freedom to talk about the Bible, it was, it was uh, much more freedom in Russia at that time than had been before. But I'll never forget, at the Academy of Social Sciences, there were about 200 people with PhDs in my audience, and the first question a guy stood up, and this was in 1990, a guy stood up and said, you must tell us why in Russia and, and America, we, we all have, both you and we, have uh, lots of resources. We have smart people that can do science. We have uh, creative people to, to uh, design new products. Uh, we have all these things going for us, both in Russia and America, but your economy is thriving and ours is dead in the water. What does President Bush know? 
that makes him a success and that uh, Gorbachev does not know? Please tell us. And I answered, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't run the economy. The economy has a life of its own. Yes, there are regulations, but it's not a command economy. It's not something Bush even knows how to run, and we're glad he doesn't try to run it. Well, I had all these puzzled looks, follow-up questions, but it was a different world. And I, I think we underestimate the extraordinary um, resource that we have in a free market. And we need to make it more and more fair. We need to have uh, more and more uh, safety nets to help uh, protect people, yes, uh, but let's still honor creativity, drive, uh, insight, and uh, people's uh, willingness to make the world better uh, and honor that and reward them. But there again is a sphere of sovereignty, the ideas of the Reformation that freed the economy from the government control and from church control were the earliest seeds of a free market under the uh, leadership of Martin Luther even long before uh, Adam Smith. Um, the idea of respecting every person to, uh, to have that accountability to God. So uh, I do encourage you to think through which of these spheres you live in, you work in especially, and uh, how these biblical teachings, and maybe others, would be uh, uh, more, more uh, appropriately applied so that God's sovereignty could be a, a vibrant aspect of your work in education, or your work in, in uh, the arts, or uh, government, or as a leader in, in the church, in organized religion. Now, I leave it as a kind of exercise for you you don't have to fill out all the boxes right away, but even to pick one of these, say family life, or, or another one, say uh, business, and then go through these remaining blocks and at least put a sentence in each. For example, for family life, how can justice and fairness be more clear, more um, uh, consistently applied in our family. Now, we probably, some of us have been in families where one of the children was always preferred by the parents and the rest of us had to struggle. I don't know if you've had that experience. I've had that experience. Um, I've seen it in much worse circumstances uh, where uh, parents are just not fair. And it's so hard, but it's very important for parents to think through how, what is it fair? You can't give the same thing to every child because every child is different. But how can you be uh, at least fair in terms of, of uh, uh, encouragement and opportunity and, and help for every child so that none of them uh, feels hampered by uh, any kind of neglect or unfairness in the family? Love and compassion. There are so many ways, not only for the parents to show love and compassion, but the children to show that love back to the parents and to one another to really create a, a bit of heaven on earth when uh, children, not only among themselves, but when they have the neighbor kids over. I was, uh, uh, we have only two children. Our, our son would have, uh, a, it was a big deal to have like three or four friends over, which is fine. And they had a great time uh, working on uh, different projects. Our daughter, uh, a little bit younger, uh, frequently had parties with 35 or 40 people. You can't fit that many people in our home. But uh, they'd be uh, in the backyard with speakers uh, set up to uh, you know, blast some music and um, on the deck and in and out of the house and having a grand time. And it was her way of showing love and, and friendship and compassion with her uh, classmates and with neighbors. Uh, obviously, there are standards. So I'm sitting upstairs and I hear some awful so-called rap music playing on our uh, tape player. And so I 
quietly go downstairs, push the stop button, take that tape out, put a gospel uh, uh, rock, gospel rock tape in, so it's jazzy, you know, real uh, contemporary music, put it in, turn the volume a little bit higher, put the other uh, tape in my pocket, went back upstairs. Well, my daughter runs up in about a minute. She said, uh, George wants to know what, what happened to his tape. I said, well, I got it. So I went back down and talked to George. And you know, here's how I explained it to him. I said, you, know, you can, this is your tape. I'll give it back to you in a couple of days. Uh, but we need to talk. And I, I just want you to know that you're always welcome in our house. But do you know who owns that tape player? He said, oh, Krista does. I said, no, Krista doesn't own the tape player. Who owns the tape player? He says, well, you do. I said, no, I don't own the tape player. And he says, uh, Mrs. DeRee, she owns the tape player. I said, no, she doesn't own the tape player. Who owns the tape player? I said to him. George said, I have no idea. <laughs> I said, Jesus owns the tape player. And he doesn't like your version of rock music, of of uh, rap music, because uh, it degrades women, and he created all women. So I tried to share some truth, some gospel with him, and we got together a couple of days later, talked with him for a while, gave him his uh, tape back. Uh, but uh, there are opportunities to be a witness, and at the same time to, to make our homes uh, available to uh, children from uh, all kinds of backgrounds. At any rate, uh, so compassion, also uh, stewardship and accountability. That's a tough one. How are we, how are we using our home as God's house? Uh, not, he's not just the guest at our house. It is his house. We pay the taxes, we pay the mortgage, but it still is his house. And, and how are we accountable? That's something uh, that I'm working on. I, I need to work on better. Uh, and also awakening and awareness. To be uh, aware of God's presence, to be awakened to, uh, to even these other principles um, uh, in our family life. Do you see how you could fill out these boxes? And uh, for your sake, you don't have to hand them in, uh, but I'd be uh, glad to uh, talk with you about what you uh, come up with as well. So God's sovereignty is a social truth. He's sovereign over at least these nine areas, our personal lives, our family lives, our lives in education and the sciences, our lives in government, if only the way we pay our taxes or our, our vote, and oh, those, are, those are big things. And in media and uh, the arts and business and professional life and, and in organized religion and being church, being Emmanuel Church. Is that helpful? Because so it's not just one principle of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty applies every situation. And it's a, a huge um, liberating truth that um, wherever we are, you know, there's going to be issues to resolve that, that are so complex, so difficult. Um, it's so liberating to know that, that God is present, that he's sovereign in that situation, and that it, it may be complicated, it may be difficult, we may suffer some in the process, but that we can look to him in even the most ungodly circumstance. We look to him for his protection and wisdom to make good decisions, because every sphere of life is under his sovereignty. He is the Lord in every case. All right, and God's sovereignty is, is personal uh, too. Um, there's a great uh, passage in Philippians chapter two, verses five through 11. I'd like to uh, share for just a, a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, open up for uh, questions. Uh, here is this uh, text. And we'll switch back to the other chart. Uh, here is this text where it says, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, the, uh, the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord is not something that should be said. 
in, in the end times. But, but uh, it's a way of acknowledging his authority in the here and now, that Jesus Christ is Lord now in our uh, situations here. Um, I was going to develop that further, but I'm going to step back from that and tell you another story that's crucial, I think, to understand the sovereignty of God in the contemporary postmodern uh, world. Um, the, uh, uh, if you think of all the different disciplines of the university, the, probably the simplest is mathematics. So in mathematics, we have not only natural numbers or basic arithmetic, but of course, algebra and calculus and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, non-Euclidean geometries and uh, you know, analytic uh, geometry, of course, huge number of areas. But uh, what seemed to bother people about 120, 140 years ago bothered mathematicians is that that the uh, truths of arithmetic are true in every circumstance. If you add two pencils to two pencils, you're going to have four pencils. But what makes two plus two four? What makes that truth true in all circumstances? Um, and uh, you know, division problems or multiplication, all of that is true whether you're dealing with, with dollars or tulip bulbs or uh, chairs, whatever, uh, basic arithmetic principles work all the time. Today we're celebrating 50 years since uh, landing uh, a couple of people on the moon. They were doing some basic arithmetic along with, of course, calculus and analytic geometry to get the trajectories right so they could land safely. But arithmetic was at the ground of all of that as well. And it worked. They worked. They got all the fuel added in, the number of gallons of fuel that they needed. You know, simple arithmetic that we take for granted all mattered big time for life and death at that uh, venture 50 years ago. But it bothered people starting especially around 140 years ago. How is it true all the time? And the answer that many people gave was, that's how God made it. All right? So God is the author of arithmetic. God is the author of this extraordinary system by which we can accountably keep track of so many important things. But non-believers bristled at that. And among them was a man by the name of Bertrand Russell. How many have ever heard of Bertrand Russell? Uh, very self-proclaimed atheist, uh, fought the idea of believing in God for decades. And by, for whatever reason, God gave him a life of almost 100 years. So he was fighting God a long time, a long time. And he decided to fix this problem by coming up with a way to invent numbers by human ingenuity, and then we could invent how those numbers relate in arithmetic and you know, geometry and calculus and algebra and all those other fields. Um, but, if, but we could start by inventing numbers ourselves. And to do it with set theory. So define the number one as the, the number that's always equal to itself, something like that. And then they would create all the numbers, a whole system of generating all the numbers in the natural number system. One, two, three, four, et cetera, uh, uh, toward infinity. And he came out with this uh, amazing theory that he published with a philosopher by the name of Alfred North Whitehead. Came out with this giant book explaining how set theory was the basis of arithmetic, and we don't have to appeal to God anymore. I was going to say hallelujah, but he would not have said hallelujah. Well, what is amazing is that scholars snatched up this book, read it, and by the very next day after it was available, the very next day, 
published articles in local newspapers to be the first one to debunk his uh, approach. Because set theory is riddled with paradoxes. And since it's riddled with paradoxes, you would embed those paradoxes into arithmetic and make arithmetic very problematic. And you don't want to base arithmetic on paradoxes when God already gave us arithmetic. So the, there was this uh, spiritual confrontation. Now, what is the paradox in uh, set theory? Um, one of the paradoxes is uh, you can have, uh, follow with me, you know, put your thinking caps on. This is math class for a couple minutes, all right? Uh, think of th that you can have a set of all infinite sets. Uh, now, is the set of all infinite sets also a member of itself? Since it's an infinite set, that's a member of itself. So you can have all the sets that are members of themselves, such as the set of all infinite sets. The set of people in this room is not a person. So the set of people in this room is not a member of itself, all right? Because the set of people is not a person, all right? So therefore, the question would be, is the set of all sets that are not members of, them, of themselves members of themselves? So if they're not a member of itself, if the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, all right, but if it's the set of those that are not members of themselves, then they are members of themselves. To be a set of, the, of all sets not members of themselves if they're not a member of itself, then they would be necessarily a member of itself. So therefore, not a member of that set. So you have a vicious cycle, all right? So even in set theory, you would have a paradox, a self-referential paradox. Uh, to take a more artistic uh, model, the barber of Seville shaves everybody who doesn't shave himself. All right? So who shaves the barber of Seville? Does he shave himself? But if he shaves all those that don't shave themselves, then he doesn't. But if he doesn't shave himself, then he does shave himself. So it's the same kind of paradoxes that we could generate in set theory. So, so uh, and here's another uh, simple example. If you have simply the statement, if you have a pen and pencil, write down, this is false. Just three words. Now, is that statement true? Well, if it's true, then it's false, right? Because it says it's false. If it's true, then it's false. But if it's false, then it's true. Because if it says of itself that it's false and it is false, then it's true. So if you have a self-referential statement like that, which you have to be able to allow in set theory, then you can't use set theory as a basis for arithmetic because it would build in all these paradoxes. Um, so the, um, the whole uh, system of uh, establishing arithmetic on the basis of set theory uh, got a bad reputation. And uh, Russell continued to try to defend it. Now, here's what he tried to do. He says, look, what we have to do is say uh, it works as long as we don't allow any sentence to be self-referential. It's that self-reference that gets us into trouble. So don't allow any sentence to refer to itself. So someone asked Russell, does that sentence refer to itself? Of course it does. To say you can't have any sentences referring to themselves is to have a sentence that refers to itself, saying that this sentence can't refer to itself. So think about it. The point is that this whole idea of paradox 
undermine Russell's effort. Now, set theory is still very popular and very useful. Um, so nothing against set theory, but to replace arithmetic, not so useful. Um, and it's these paradoxes that have often uh, been in, uh, in the way of people uh, simplifying life and, and avoiding the issues of God's amazing sovereignty. So the third chart that we're going to look at just for one minute. What I've done here, we have the paradox of, of God's sovereignty, which I, I put in um, under the theology uh, paradoxes, the second row on this chart, uh, God's sovereignty. Um, we'll uh, scroll up uh, two more uh, pages to uh, God's sovereignty. Uh, we have, uh, therefore, uh, uh, paradoxes like God's complete sovereignty. Just go uh, the other way. Go down. Go down on the document. Down, 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 down. One more. Uh, Is that the end? Yes. That's the end? OK, so this didn't get on there. Everyone has a copy of it. So the second block down here is the paradox we talked about before of God's sovereignty and how free will is in tension, paradoxical tension with that. But the point of this chart is to say that life is full of paradoxes. Every discipline of the university has paradoxes. And uh, there's at least one for each of these 15 uh, disciplines. Uh, and so nothing to be ashamed of if we have paradoxes in theology and even in arithmetic where uh, Bertrand Russell was trying to have a paradox-free uh, creation of arithmetic without any reference to God. Uh, Gödel's theory proved uh, uh, here on the bottom of the second page of this chart, uh, Gödel's proof, G-O, Uma, D-E-L, Proof. Uh, there's no consistent, finite set of principles from which we can generate all the truths of arithmetic, even the most elementary natural number arithmetic, that he was able to prove that uh, Russell's project was impossible, even uh, within arithmetic. No finite set of principles can generate all the, the truths of arithmetic, which is kind of paradoxical. We think of arithmetic as a nice, simple, closed system, um, but ultimately it's a statement of faith, and we still use the arithmetic that God gave us as part of creation. So, hallelujah, glory to God, and his sovereignty uh, making arithmetic still work. All right?